Speaking of market corrections, how about a correction in politics? Get ready for the red wave. Last week here on the Will Kane podcast, we talked about current polling heading into the midterm elections of 2022. It's looking strong for Republicans. And that's interesting on a political note, but I'm not a political animal. I can't see politics through the prism of team sports. That's what I have, real sports. To exorcise that instinctual tribalism through. I can't see the world through red or blue glasses. I can see the world through blue and silver glasses, but I can't see the world through the lens of a Republican or a Democrat. I can't play the game of team sports. But what I can see is Republican victories in a midterm election as a market correction for some of the most odious and malignant political ideas, political philosophies, and political movements of the last decade. Let's look at the market correction that several Republican wins through the midterm election might just represent. First, there has been an uptick in crime in every urban center of the United States of America. Robbery, homicide, shootings. We've seen crime on the rise in the USA, but nowhere more pronounced than America's biggest northeastern metro centers. Centers that have historically, overwhelmingly voted blue, voted for Democrats. Also cities that led the way in the defund the police movement. Somehow, some way, those on the left convinced themselves that in the pursuit of racial justice, it would be a good political idea to chant defund the police. Here comes the market correction. In the state of New York, on the cover of the New York Post this weekend, it is projected that incumbent Democratic Governor Kathy Hochul is now in a dead even race with her Republican challenger, Congressman Lee Zeldin. This is New York. And what issue is inspiring New Yorkers? Crime. Why is a Republican Lee Zeldin polling at 30 percent in the second bluest of blue areas outside of San Francisco, New York City. How is Lee Zeldin pulling 30% in New York City? Crime. A chicken coming home to roost. It's looking like Dr. Mehmet Oz has a real shot in Pennsylvania against Democrat John Fetterman. Why? Crime. It's shocking, and it honestly shouldn't be crime. It should be competence. Not to be mean, but John Fetterman is a walking vegetable. He is not fit for office. He can't listen to a question and buffer through the comprehension of offering up an answer. He's participating in a debate this week. We should all tune in on the national level. He's participating in a debate on Tuesday night where he gets the aid of essentially a personal teleprompter. He gets the questions translated into text form and displayed on a computer screen in front of him. He's conducting interviews with the media where the interviewer's question is again translated into text form and displayed on a computer screen for him to read and then in turn give the answer. What are Democratic politicians doing supporting? What are Democratic voters doing supporting Yet another mentally incompetent candidate. This is not mean. This is due diligence. Joe Biden was not subjected to due diligence. You and I know it's true. The entire 2020 election was a referendum on Donald Trump. And because of that, the mainstream media absolutely was complicit in protecting Joe Biden from cross-examination. Now here we are again. I watched an interview with Joe Biden this week on a weekly basis. We see Joe Biden slow down, shift into neutral and fall asleep during an interview. He did it with MSNBC's Jonathan Capehart this week when asked the very easy question of, are you going to run for president again in 2024? I mean, 
you can't serve up a bigger meatball over the center of the plate than that. And Joe Biden whiffed. And he whiffed in that dramatic fashion of a corkscrew strikeout, which actually is a more dynamic effortful motion than the snooze fest that was Joe Biden shifting down into buffering, buffering, long pause. Is he asleep? Dear God, why can't he answer this question? You know, I watched that interview thinking, I really wish Joe Biden would come on the Will Kane podcast. I watched that interview thinking, I really wish I could offer up a challenge, the challenge the American people deserve to its political leaders. Here's a interesting nugget that I'm happy to share. Dr. Mehmet Oz, running for Senate in Pennsylvania, appeared on Fox and Friends weekend this weekend and would not appear with me. Would not allow me to interview him. Why is that? Because back in the spring, I was guest hosting then called Fox News primetime, what is now Jesse Waters primetime, doing my turn guest hosting that 7 p.m. primetime show. Dr. Oz was a guest that night. It was during the Republican primaries. I asked Dr. Oz again a question that in opening was somewhat of a softball across the middle of the plate. Dr. Oz, there are questions about where you stand on abortion. When do you believe life begins? Dr. Oz, as a practiced television host and as a burgeoning politician, dodged that question. But me, having been in this business for quite some time and priding myself on being not just a talker but a listener, noticed, hey, I didn't get an answer to a fairly straightforward question, so I pressed. So when are you saying life begins? Again, now he's on ice skates and he's all over the place and he seems to be coming into some type of answer that is, well, before birth. Okay, well, that's a pretty big gap from conception to breathing air is a nine month time gap that allows for a lot of room for, oh, say, abortion. So I pressed a third time. Does life begin at conception? And on a third try, I still could not get an answer from Dr. Oz. Now, this is the type of, quite honestly, fairly gentle cross-examination that I believe is deserved by the American people. In that instance, is deserved by the Republican voter who's deciding in a primary whether or not Dr. Oz is a political performer or a real person ready to deliver on principles. And I get it. I get it, by the way. You're a politician. Your job is not to tell me the truth, at least as interpreted by the politician. Your job is to win an election. And I have a lot of friends who have told me, what are you doing? Why do you press our side? The other side doesn't press their side. And my answer to that is I don't consider myself on a side. Oh, I'm on the side of my principles and my values and my points of view and my ideology and what I believe is right and wrong. But I'm not on a team. I'm not here with Republican glasses or Democratic goggles. I am here to find out what you believe, what is true and what is real. The same thing happened to me when I interviewed Kevin McCarthy, who would be House Majority Leader on Fox and Friends Weekend just about a month ago. And I asked him very directly. Would you get behind the effort of Republican governors to declare an invasion because the federal government will not enforce our illegal immigration laws? If you win the House, Joe Biden will still be the president and we will still have a crisis. Fiscal year 2022, the numbers came out on Friday night, 2.3 million encounters. 2.3. It's a record. We've never seen that kind of number in the modern era of measuring illegal immigration, in the month of September, 230,000 encounters. We have a problem, a problem that corrupts our social welfare system, a problem that corrupts our minimum wage laws, a problem that corrupts the American culture. And there are those like Governor Ron DeSantis, would-be governor of Arizona, Kerry Lake, who have said they will declare 
an invasion, empowering states to step up where the federal government will not. If Republicans win the House, they'll still have to contend with a Democratic president in Joe Biden, meaning the federal government will still not solve that problem, will still not solve the issue of fentanyl flooding across our border. The federal government, even if Congress is controlled by Republicans, will not be able to solve a problem that could be solved by the states if we can empower those states to declare an invasion. Did Kevin McCarthy like me asking that question? No, he didn't. I knew it sitting there that day. He knew it. I knew it. We knew it. I don't care. His job that day is to get a team elected. My job that day is to ask and find the truth and to find out whether or not if given the privilege, yes, the privilege of serving, given the privilege of winning, will you come true? Will you hold true? Will you deliver true on your promise and my principle? Politicians need to be held to account whether or not they're on your team. And I get it. I get it. Kevin McCarthy wants to win. He doesn't need to be pressed a month out from a midterm election. Dr. Oz wants to win. He doesn't want to risk being pressed by Will Cain 18 days away from a midterm election. But what I want to know is what you'll do if you win. I want to know if the American people get to win. And I want to hold to account the highest office in the land, the president of the United States. I would love to ask that question, those questions, many more questions to Joe Biden. But that's not how politics is conducted today. There's no one looking to stand up to a cross-examination, no one looking to reveal the truth, no one looking to help the American people, only people willing to help themselves. And they'll go to any extent to win. That extent in 2022 is protecting Joe Biden from ever having to answer the questions that I just laid out. And that extent in 2022 is to protect John Fetterman running against Dr. Mehmet Oz from having to face a debate opponent, a hard question, an issue, the crime crisis in New York or Pennsylvania directly. We as the American people need to ask. The people of Pennsylvania deserve to know who's serving if they choose Dr. John or choose John Fetterman over Dr. Mehmet Oz. Is it John Fetterman or is it his wife? Who's running for senator in Pennsylvania? I would ask Fetterman that hard question, just like I would ask that hard question of Dr. Oz, because it's deserved by the people of Pennsylvania. But. Lee Zeldin running tight in New York. Dr. Oz with a real shot in Pennsylvania. Oregon running tight. Why? Crime. Because there's a market correction on one of the stupidest political ideas of the modern era, and that is defund the police. How about a market correction on critical race theory? Dividing our children by race, gender, whatever the latest. Identity politics Fad of the month. Maybe we saw that market correction in Virginia with the election of Governor Glenn Youngkin. How about the market correction of illegal immigration, which we just discussed? Well, Carrie Lake, who has promised to declare an invasion within the first hour of election as governor of Arizona, is polling plus 1.6 percent, according to Real Clear Politics. More on Carrie Lake coming up in just a moment here on the Will Kane podcast. But there's your market correction. Greg Abbott up big in Texas. There's your market correction on illegal immigration. How about a market correction on government shutdowns and spending over the past two years? We've run record deficits. Joe Biden's bragging about a $1.4 trillion deficit reduction. Well, that's because we were at record deficits. Through COVID spending, shutting down the economy, disrupting the supply chain, injecting the world with money. Matter of fact, printing money, quantitative easing has been not just a two-year problem, but a 20-year problem. The Fed interfering in market corrections, making sure we never have 
a slight dip turn into a recession, making sure we never have a recession turn into a depression, never clearing out the weeds of bad debt throughout our economy, bad investments, stepping in to keep the party rolling, print more money, avoid the market correction. That chicken also seems to be coming home to roost as we're sitting on the precipice of an ugly, ugly recession caused by inflation and attempted to be corrected by rising interest rates. That chicken is coming home to roost as the economy is everyone's number one issue. Inflation, everyone's number two issue. Whether or not it's crime, CRT, illegal immigration, government shutdowns, government spending, quantitative easing. We're watching real ideas reckoned with, held to account by you, the American people. I guess my question is, as we see, if we see what looks to be a massive red wave, can we count on Kevin McCarthy? Can we count on Dr. Mehmet Oz? Can we count on these politicians to not just be a political market correction, but to be a principal market correction? Will they hold true to their promise or will this just be a political quantitative easing? Will this just be we get more Republicans who are always like Democrats and will we get more of the same politics? Or will we get finally something that reflects the American people's principles and those politicians promises? Story number two. Is Carrie Lake for real? And is Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez a performer? The performance of politics. Carrie Lake looks like the real deal. Carrie Lake running for governor in Arizona has promised that if she is elected governor within the first hour, she will declare an invasion on the southern border in Arizona, setting off a constitutional crisis over who will handle, who can handle. The crisis of illegal immigration, will it be those who will not, those who refuse the federal government, or will it be the states? As many argue, are empowered by the Constitution to declare an invasion and step up and devote resources and solve the problem at the state level of illegal immigration. I think Carrie Lake means what she says. I think Carrie Lake is the real deal. Look, she has spent decades in the media. That tells me that she knows the nature of the media. She knows its corruption. She knows the tricks. She knows its biases. She's made a practice, a sport. She's made a reality show out of calling corrupt journalists to account calling them out on their loaded questions, calling them out on their partisan behavior. She's calling out the media and calling to account politicians. She spent 20 years on television. She certainly would be a practiced performer. She certainly know how to perform. I'm of the belief, having spent a decade myself in this business, there's two types of media personalities. There is the talented performer and there is the authentic person those are the two successful quote-unquote media personalities oh there's a great big soup of lukewarm mediocrity in between but those that you really really see rise to the top are either real or talented performers i'll give you an example James Corden, talented performer. Last week here on the Will Kane podcast, we talked about what an a-hole is the late night host of CBS James Corden. He revealed himself in berating the wait staff at a New York City restaurant, Balthazar. Then he was banished from the restaurant, never to be brought back again until he profusely apologized to the owner of the restaurant. Of course, elitism. Not to the waitstaff, but to the owner. 
James Corden spends his nights with a funny British accent and a jovial personality. Hey, look at the nice fat guy. He's interesting. He's funny. He's talented. You would think he is nice. You know who else? It's a talented performer. Ellen DeGeneres gets out there and dances with her audience, has a good time, smiles and jokes. Ellen, she's just like us. Wish I was Ellen's neighbor. No, you don't. Ellen, who berated her staff. Ellen, who threw things. Ellen, who's a talented performer. That's not to say every talented performer is just inherently fake and putting a big ruse on you, that they're inherently the opposite of their performance. You know, Stephen A. Smith is a very talented performer. I also like Stephen A. Smith, but when the camera lights go on, Stephen A. knows how to entertain. There's all types of performers, and a lot of them rise to the top. They know. They know how to perform. Then there are those whose only path to success will come or not come through authenticity. I would humbly nominate myself from this category. I have to be me. If you like it, you like it. If you don't, you don't. My co-hosts on Fox and Friends Weekend are real. I can promise you what you see on television is the same thing you see during commercial breaks. A lot of times what you hear during commercial breaks bleeds right into what's on television. Rachel Campos Duffy and Pete Hegseth are authentic. But here's the interesting thing about authenticity. All authenticity guarantees you is a potential path to success down the stream of being real. It is necessary, but not sufficient. Here's what I mean by that. I was watching this past weekend, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. You've seen this video perhaps by now. If not, I really encourage you to go check it out. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is giving a town hall, and there are protesters in New York City at Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's public meeting. These are people upset. These are Democratic voters upset with AOC. It's worth noting why they're upset. They're mad because she's voting to fund all this money going to the war in Ukraine. They think she's gone corporate. They think she's gone neocon. They think she's a performer. I think she's real. Here's what I mean by that. Watch this video. And AOC is fascinating. They're chanting, hey, hey, ho, ho, AOC has got to go. And, you know, they're, they're playing some drums and some tambourines. It's taking that beat. Uh, 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 uh. And AOC is sitting on the stage, you know, and then she starts dancing, rocking her shoulders back and forth, almost not almost literally mocking them. And but she's moving and she's having a good time. Sitting there with her. She's sitting up on the edge of a stage, her legs spread wide, holding a bottle of water, just dancing. And then she goes up at one point and grabs the microphone and she starts She starts mocking them. She starts mimicking a thick Puerto Rican accent. Listen, listen, okay? She's doing that. She's mocking them. Listen, listen, okay? And let me tell you something. You can't tear your eyes away. I mean, look, for those of you listening right now that already hate AOC, you're not going to like what I have to say because you already hate AOC. But that video is going to be played on Fox News. It has been played on Fox News. And it's going to be a win for anybody that hates OC because you see something there. You see something that makes your stomach turn. You see something that you dislike, rightfully. But I'm here to tell you, those that love AOC see something that they also like. You like it in the way because it confirms what you already believe about AOC. They see it in the way that they like it that it already confirms what they believe about AOC. What I'm telling you, she's being real. She's being authentic. I think the person you see in that video is the same person you would meet in real life if you met AOC. She's not momentarily letting down the mask. You know what I'm saying? She's not having even a bad moment. She's in all of her glory. For those that hate her, you see, I think rightfully, some really ugly personality characteristics. Megalomania, narcissism. For those that love AOC, they see 
Can't get anything on me. No problem. I have thick skin. I'm sassy. I'm the IG influencer. It's a win for those that hate and a win for those that love. And I'm here to tell you, I believe it's because it's authentic. She's real. Hey, you got to give it to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. She commands an audience. She commands influence. And I think it's because she's authentic. Now, let me play this forward to the argument that I'm making. Being authentic is necessary, but not sufficient. It's enough to project charisma. It's enough to establish some magnetism. It's honestly the same thing that makes it so people can't turn away from President Trump. But the question is, what happens after the authenticity? If it's necessary, then the question is, is it sufficient for the shallow yes queens? The answer is yes. For those that need more, I think the answer is clearly no. If you authentically reveal yourself, you've just crossed the first hurdle. You might be authentically reviled. You might be authentically loved. But something about this moment with AOC makes me think we're not looking at the end of AOC. We're looking at the beginning of idiocracy, and we're going to get more. We're going to get more AOCs, not less. We're going to get more politicians as influencers that don't really care for their voters, that only care for their own celebrity. And they're going to have their fans that tell them, hey, you know what? You're right. That is unless, as we talked about in story number one here today on the Will Kane podcast, we can get politicians, either the performers or the authentic, to subject themselves to the cross-examination, to subject themselves to the debate, to subject themselves to the hard questions. And those that will, those that will are the ones that we can believe. We'll deliver on promise. I will tell you now that after President Trump made himself someone that you could not turn away, he also subjected himself to 30 minutes with Savannah Guthrie, to hours at the podium with a hostile press. He subjected himself to the cross-examination, to the questions, to the debate. He subjected himself to our chance to find out whether or not he was a performer or he was principled. All that I ask is that Joe Biden do the same. All that I ask is that Kevin McCarthy do the same, that Dr. Mehmet Oz do the same, that John Fetterman actually take a question and not read a translation. All that I ask is that we can take this world of principles and promises that is so important that we would ask for it in showbiz And we hold it true in politics that we can find out, are you a performer? Are you authentic? Are you real? And is that good enough? Is that sufficient? Will you hold true to your promise? Hey, it's Will Kane. Click here to subscribe to the Fox News channel on YouTube. It's the best way to get our latest interviews and highlights. And click to subscribe to the Will Kane podcast for full episodes right now.